Hello. I talked to you in class about this, but um, I'm also recording this video very briefly to give you an idea of what I'm looking for on section test number two, uh, which was due Monday, uh, November 12th by noon. Um, so, uh, section test number two, it's the same format as the last time. Um, so, you know what you're responsible for, you know what these things are, you've written one of these already. Um, you know I'm very forthcoming with, uh, with um, thingers, uh, extensions, uh, thingers. Uh, yeah, but, you know, this requires a conversation, we've got to talk about it, right? So if you work with me, I'll work with you. Um, it's your responsibility to make sure that I get your assignment, that I get the right assignment, and you're responsible for the content of it, I'm responsible for grading it. Um, zero tolerance and plagiarism, uh, we haven't had any problems with this so far, uh, but like I say, these are the two most common theorists um, uh, studied in any intro to ethics course. Um, and reams have been written about these guys. Um, I should warn you, I've read reams about these guys, and I've even written some of the stuff that's out there about these guys. So um, don't plagiarize, just don't do it, and we'll be fine. Um, it, just for fun, First formulation of the categorical imperative, I should never act except in such a manner that I can always also will the maximum of my action should become a universal law or law of nature. Well, you're asking, should I plagiarize? Well, should could plagiarism, using the work of others and claiming it as your own, become a universal law of nature? Would you be able to you know, it's what if everybody did it all the time? Well, it, what Kant would point out is then, you know, there would be nothing to plagiarize because everybody's using the work of others. So it's unthinkable, right? So you've got a perfect duty not to plagiarize. I just gave you the structure um, for at least the perfect duty in the first question here. Um, so I've given you lots of video material. Um, you've got the texts, you've got my lectures. Um, all of which you're responsible for. Um, these are skinny little books, but they're substantial arguments. So um, give yourself plenty of time. And oh boy, proofread, proofread. Um, I want um, two paragraphs minimum um, for responses to these questions and uh, full sentences and a paragraph is a minimum of three sentences. I hate to be nitpicky like this. I don't like counting sentences either, right? But I need to put the minimum somewhere, right? Um, because the, the reason why I've got these stipulations is because um, it's, I was getting one and two sentence responses to these questions that are worth 5% of your final grade. Can't happen, right? So anyhow, Two questions on Kant, one on Mill, and one comparative question where you're making an argument. Uh, first question has to do with that first formulation of the categorical imperative, uh, which I quote for you, um, where Kant draws a distinction between perfect and imperfect duties. I want you to introduce this distinction between perfect and imperfect duties. By introduce, I mean I don't want a statement like you know, there's a distinction between perfect and imperfect duties. Perfect duties are a stronger form of moral obligation. Imperfect duties are a weaker form of moral obligation. Well, that's right. That's not sufficient. What I want you to do is show me how we make the distinction. Perfect duties stem from reason and uh, imperfect duties stem from the will. That's in my video material, we discussed that in class, and it's in your Kant book, right? So um, that's what we're looking for there, right? And just to make sure, um, I, I, I know that you know what you're talking about, I want you to illustrate the distinction um, briefly with examples, right? Um, so I just gave you an example pertaining to plagiarism of a perfect duty, right? Um, 
that 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 stems from this formula first formulation. It's not hard to come up with perfect and imperfect duties um, in terms of Kantian morality. Right. Um, also, feel free to use Kant's, um, but nonetheless, illustrate with examples. So that's question number one. Uh, question number two pertains to the transition between the first formulation and the second formulation, the humanity principle. Kant introduces the humanity principle, act in such a way that you treat humanity, whether it's in your own person or the person of another, always as an end in itself and merely, never merely as a means. As another formulation of the categorical imperative, this principle, he argues, rests on the dignity of human beings. He argues that human beings are objects of respect. And I mentioned in class, as from page 36, don't get hung up on the word object. What he means here is that human beings are objectively valuable rather than subjectively valuable. Right? Um, is something that's subjectively valuable um, it is based on my inclination. Something that's objectively valuable is something that reason shows you has an absolute worth. Human beings fall into that category. Why? Because we've got autonomy and I've just said too much. Why are human beings, according to Kant, objects of respect? I just gave you the answer, autonomy. Um, define it though. Sandel does a good job of this. Um, I talked about it in class, that sort of thing. And the other thing I want you to talk about, how does this position, that is the humanity principle, follow naturally, as Kant argues it does, from the first formulation of the categorical imperative? Well, it goes, because we can use the first formulation of the categorical imperative, we demonstrate that we've got autonomy. And since we've got autonomy, we are objects of respect and of absolute worth and can serve as the basis for another formulation of the categorical imperative, introduce the humanity principle. That is the structure of the thing. Right? Um, so uh, basically with the Kant questions, I'm making sure you know what the heck he's talking about. Here's a confession. The first time I took this course, I didn't really know what he was talking about. Right? Of course, I've done higher level study, and now I know far too well what the heck he's talking about. Anyhow. Um, that is the deal. So, um, Mill, I ask you to engage the notion of political liberty um, uh, in Mill's On Liberty to, in, in how it addresses a specific criticism of the principle of utility related to individual human rights, which was introduced by Michael Sandel in Justice Episode 2, Posted to Moodle. I called it up for you in class the other day. I think it was 2650 when uh, Sandel uh, goes to, uh, starts to address this notion of individual rights, right? Um, it, it, a criticism of, of the principle of utility. Um, it, on liberty is one way in which Mill addresses this, so um, that's there. So what I want you to do is introduce the notion of politi political liberty. What is it? Define it. Right, advanced by Mill. All right, it's a basic line in the sand. It's 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 a limit to the power of the collective over individual autonomy, not autonomy. Um, the independence. He uses the word independence. So, um, where do we place the limit? Mill introduces a principle of harm, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Right. And how does this respond to the criticism um, introduced by Sandel? And so you'll have to go to Sandel and see uh, how that criticism shook its way out. Um, and it just basically, I want you to show me that you know what the heck is going on um, with why Mill is introducing this notion of political liberty and what political liberty is. Okay. So, um, that's hopefully pretty straightforward. Now, there's this argument from Roderick that I've got you engaging with um, in the fourth part of question here. All right, uh, you've got the Roderick video on Moodle. Um, there's a transcript, so if you don't like listening to Roderick, you can just read it if you want. Um, but I block quote um, a hunk of text from the transcript here. 
<coughs> basically what he's arguing is that well these two moral theories are the titans of modern ethical theory right and this is why we study them in every ethics class that um, is worth the name ethics class um, the funny thing about them is that there are knockdown criticisms of each. Knockdown criticisms. Um, I've given you a few of them, that sort of thing. Uh, this is what leads um, Roderick to argue that these are models of moral action rather than practically apl applicable moral theories. Right. So what Roderick is saying here is that now that you've read Kant, don't be a Kantian. Just don't, because the system as a system doesn't work. Don't be a utilitarian, because the system just as a system doesn't work. You can't just apply the system that way. What these are good for is helping you, as he says, um, you, you, you think about moral life. So more specifically, if you're interested in the way that the consequence of the action colors the moral quality of the action, turn to the utilitarian because they've got a good analysis here. If you're interested in duty and the way the motive or intention that stands behind the action colors the moral quality of an action, turn to Kant or the Kantians more generally right? because they have an interesting analysis. But these two moral theories are just models. They're ways of thinking about moral life. They're not practically applicable ethics. They're not a way. They're not, you know, a rule book for how to live your life. So don't be a Kantian. Don't be a utilitarian. All right. Now, uh, what I want you to do, and I've thrown you into the middle of an argument here, and I'm asking you to yourself take a position and argue it. And there are a number of ways that you can do this. Right? First thing you have to do is show me that you know what the heck Roderick is talking about with this criticism. Right? So, step one, what does Roderick mean by calling these theories moral models of moral action? I just sort of went over that for you. Right? Now, given Roderick's argument, it would seem that, you know, he's made an assertion and he's either right or he's wrong, all right? In either case, it would come down to an argument. How do we know whether he's right or he's wrong? Well, we argue with him, all right? So what I'm asking you to do is argue with him. So supporting your position with an argument, one that makes use of your understanding of the material studied in this course, all right? Don't just argue about something that happened to your sister on the way to school or something along those lines, argue using Kant and Mill, right? And Roderick, right? Um, how would you respond to this ass assessment of Kantian or utilitarian morality? So, what I'm asking you to do is take one of these positions, right? If you think Utilitarian morality is, yeah, it's compromised, it's, it's, it's bunk, it's not a practically applicable moral theory. But, on the other hand, Kant's moral theory is one that can be a practically applicable moral theory rather than just a model for moral action. Then you'd have to defend Kant against this criticism. If Vice versa, you think utilitarianism is awesome, right, and Roderick is wrong, then you'd have to defend utilitarianism against Roderick's position here. If you think Roderick's right, basically what I want you to do is engage both Kant and Mill and show me how he's right. right? Now, the hardest and still possible way to respond to this question is to say Roderick's outright wrong, and both utilitarianism and Kantian morality are substantial and practical moral theories and not just models. Right. So those are the ways um, that you can respond to this question. 
But we've just hit that point in the course where I think it's important that you should make an argument. It's part of the learning outcomes for this course. Um, it, we've been looking at arguments for a little while now. It's Now it's time for you to make one, right? So um, I have office hours on Thursday. If you have any questions, um, please let me know. Come, it, it, I'm here to be handy. All right. Um, it, it, let's 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 be utilitarian about this. Plus, I'm the instructor for this course, and I have a contractual and moral duty to help you out. So, um, I look forward to reading your responses, and uh, have good days, one for each of you.